spending all morning because LA is really hard to do stand up. So it's like literally I'll send over like 200 messages a month. So like you just have to people are like, wow, you're really booked for an LA comic. And I'm like, you have no idea. Let's let's start with that. Yeah. Let's, let's start. Yeah. Here. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you for being here. I wanna, Happy to be here. I just want to say, no, in the outset, last night was a lot of fun. Yeah. You, you did really well. Oh, thank you. You're very comfortable on stage. I'm <laughs> jealous of that. I'm trying to get myself to that point. How long have you been? Uh, a little over a year. Oh, Jesus Christ. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> little over a year and you're surprised you're not comfortable oh my god yeah <laughs> i it took me like five years before i stopped physically having a panic attack on stage and i didn't know it was a panic attack until i had a full-blown panic attack it's just embarrassing this is how dumb i am i thought i was allergic to the microphone because my hands would go numb oh shit and i do you get lead poisoning <laughs> Because, like, I can't wear certain earrings. My skin is so sensitive. So I'm oh, like, I guess. Oh, so there's, like, actual, like, okay, maybe this like, is. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I guess I can't hold metal for 10 minutes. I don't know what the fuck is going on because my hands would go numb. And then I had my first full-blown panic attack. And I was like, oh, my God, I've been having a panic attack on stage for five years straight. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, how, it was bad. So how long have you been doing stand-up for total? Uh, 17 years. 17 years. Mm -hmm. Holy fuck. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I want to cover a little bit about when you first started, but you brought something up very interesting as we were transitioning into mm -hmm. this. Why? Because I feel like there's this misconception then about LA, how it's like, it's such a big scene. So there's a lot of like, it was like, as like a beginner, there's probably like a lot of open mics you can go to a lot of like, I'm kind of just shooting from the hip here, yeah, but like I mean they kind of... LA's actively dying, it looks like, from the outside in, like, politically speaking, but, it's like... dying because ho it's... I mean, this is my opinion and my take on it, but I genuinely feel like LA is connected to movie and TV industry. Like, everything is, like, babysitters babysit the kids of actors and, like, yeah. screen directors and set dressers and accountants account for people who are, like, TV writers and cafes serve people who are taking meetings and... None of that is happening because of the pandemic, then a double strike, then the IATSE negotiations, and then every... What's that last one? I, um, IATSE, they're like the film and crew. They were like potentially maybe going to strike, even though it looks like they're... I think it got ratified. So there was about to be another strike looming. And then um, the streamers, their financials are unsustainable. It's like yeah. so weird that they're just giving random shitbag comics $20 million. It's like, <laughs> no, it's not weird. Uh, there's not enough money for that. It's crazy. The fuck? Like, <laughs> it's crazy. I'm, I'm going to respect your time, but I just want to say I wish we had like three hours. You are great. <laughs> oh my God. But it's like f fiscally, that's irresponsible. Yeah. Well, like, that's, yeah. that, that's what I was always thinking about because when streamers first came out and well, when they moved to like, because Netflix was always like the blockbuster by mail type thing. Mm -hmm. But when they fully moved to streaming and then like who became big and everyone followed, I remember looking at that like, okay, but this is, this is a bubble, right? 100%. Because all the money that, if you really start digging into like how the cable companies made all their money, yes, it's ad revenue, but it's like, it's, it's every other like big conglomerates. Like you got the big three that own mm -hmm. the little ones, own the little ones, and it all kind of trickles to the top. So yeah. it's like, okay, if the cool thing about streaming is that it's cheap, you have everything on demand, and there's no ads. And I was thinking about this one was like the still like the seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine mm -hmm. era. I was like, okay, well this is gonna have to go up. Oh, there's no, there's no way that it doesn't because like if you looked at something like okay, so obviously if you can't tell I'm a big fucking dork, <laughs> and so when the four hour Justice League came out, that was supposed to be a big seller for HBO, where yeah, it was yeah. like a bunch of max subscribers and things. But I was thinking about it like, okay, that's already like superheroes are a big thing, but like the people who specifically follow creatives in that space is kind of niche, and the following for that's already kind of niche already. And it's like. How many of these people that want to see this already have a subscription? Are they? Is this going to be like? Obviously, I'm very happy that it came out, but as like a big picture thing, is it a problem? It is, and financially, even with stunts like that, there's something called boomerang subscriptions where they'd subscribe for like a month and then cut it. Right. So I mean, it just wasn't financial because their whole business model is 
it's almost like Walmart where they like come into a small town and they cut their prices so low that these mom and pop shops can't compete. And then when they go out of business, they'll raise their prices. So that's the way a lot of like disrupting an industry, a lot of these tech uh, type things, that's the way they work. So they disrupted the industry and it's like, okay, yes. And now they have this huge presence, but now they have to figure out how to restructure to be um, financially solvent. And so uh, that's why you're seeing so many mergers and so many like HBO and uh, what was it? Discovery becoming max like all of these things are going to fold into each other until it starts making financial sense so it's just like a really bad time in the industry historically bad it's so bad uh but i also think that's why la is quote unquote dying like it seems more dead because the primary it's like a coal mining town that's out of coal right because the executives can't decide how they want to fucking mine coal. Uh, But that's essentially what's going on. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the amazing people over at Chop Chili Company. Guys, they are the original sponsor of this podcast, and I could not be happier to continue to be working with these guys. I get it. It's New Mexico. Everyone loves red, green, both. But this genuinely is my favorite brand of chili here in the state of New Mexico. And I love being able to partner up with these guys. They are absolutely phenomenal. Zane and the rest of the team at Chop Chili do an amazing job running that company. And they make an absolutely phenomenal product. And right now they are running a very special promotional on their Instagram Go check them out on Instagram. Go give them a follow. And as they post pictures with the hashtag Where's My Chili Challenge, if you can guess where in New Mexico that picture was taken, you can win not only free red or green chili, but also a free custom t-shirt directly from the company themselves. Again, go check them out on Instagram. Give them a follow. Check out their hashtag Where's My Chili Challenge. Win yourself some free chili. Win yourself some free shirts. They are also available in Smith's, Albertsons, Sprouts, and a ton of other uh, grocery stores in the state of New Mexico as well as El Paso, and they are expanding out to West Texas. Again, thank you so much to Zane and the rest of his amazing team over at Chop Chili. Back to the episode. In my opinion. No, yeah, and how... Obviously, this is all hypotheticals, but how long until, like, the big boys like Netflix, how long until they start putting out theatrical releases? Because that's coming, right? It has to. Haven't they already done that a little bit? Like, limited I mean, theatrical runs? I mean, they kind of did, like, for Army of the Dead, and I think they had, like, one or two more, but they didn't make that much money because mm-hmm. they were just kind of banking it on it being, hey, if you like the people behind the movie, go support it. If not, it's going to be on Netflix the same day. And you can kind of write that, because it came out in, like... 21, 22-ish, you could kind of loop that in with the pandemic stuff, but even then, like, I mean, here in Albuquerque, they just pumped in another, like, 400 million, I think, at a billion new studios or something like that, so it's like, okay, how long until this has, this has to go to the movies at some point, this has to go to the theaters. Uh, I mean, I don't know anything about the financial of uh, the theater business. Well, I would just think that there's a cap on how much money streamers can make eventually. There's only so many TVs. Yeah, and, like, ideally, it used to be, like, before things were, like, publicly traded companies and shit, like, you just had to make money. But now, because everything's, like, publicly traded stocks, you have to increasingly make more money. Right. Um, And that's just not sustainable. So I don't know what the future of anything looks like. And I think it's all very fucking stupid. And all I know is it contributes to billionaires having another fucking yacht. And I hate (laughs) all of it. That's 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 my base level understanding. That's 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 fair. No, I I I could I totally understand that. Are you because you were talking a little bit earlier about how you're writing your special, bringing the special mm-hmm. together. Once that journey is complete, do you plan on staying in L.A.? Do you plan on leaving? Uh, I'm stuck in L.A. because of my husband. I don't want to be there. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I used to, even when I was writing, the second we wrapped, I didn't have a permanent address. My address was my ex-boyfriend's address because he was nice enough to let me send him mail. <laughs> um, that's how badly I didn't want to be in L.A. Because like when we wrapped, I would immediately go get a sublet in New York and like literally lived out of two suitcases, which was unhinged. LA is actually a wonderful city. I was being a child. Uh, But it just is so hard to get on stage. And that's 
what I, I love. I mean, I really love acting and I really love writing. And I will forever in my soul be grateful to the city of Los Angeles because they just have such an actor infrastructure in there. And like people who are really dedicated to the craft and not just like a quick, oh, you're a comic. Let's coach you on this audition so you can get through it. Like really learning like a theater technique and a love for the art form behind it. Um, and so it's like I owe that to L.A. And I think it's a beautiful city. I think I have fun living there. But in terms of like as a comedian, the shit you have to go through to get on stage is unhinged. Like it's just so hard and it's so much work and it's just so much easier in New York and the quality of stage time is just so much higher you know and it's like when acting isn't going on and writing isn't going on and then if my shows that week are just shit I feel insane because I'm not making progress this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the amazing people over at High Desert Relief, a premier herbal destination right here in the state of New Mexico. They have extremely well-trained and knowledgeable staff that are more than happy to help you find what you're looking for or try something that you maybe have never thought of before. They have two locations right here in Albuquerque and a third in Santa Fe. All three will be listed in the description of this episode below. All three locations offering legendary products at absolutely legendary prices, including this awesome merch that they were so kind enough to give me. Um, they can be found at all three of the locations. Again, big thank you to all the people over at HDR. Back to the episode. And I think for me, the biggest point uh, for me personally that keeps me sane is if I feel like I'm developing and moving forward, even if my career isn't. At least if I feel like I'm learning and creating new stuff, I'll get excited. But if I feel like I'm stuck, I will start to fucking lose my mind. I was going to say, how not to sound like a fucking, you know, a mindset guru, but like, <laughs> but like how do you define progress? Like, you've been doing this for 17 years. How, yeah. well, how has that definition for you changed? It, um... Progress now, when I say that, I mean, I've just like, I'm so, I've experienced so much failure <laughs> that it's not like I'm expecting some big thing anymore. Um, so for me, like progress, it's like, yeah, there's like the external part of it that's out of my control where it's like, okay, progress would obviously be selling a TV show or even at this point getting hired to do a full polish on another feature film or like just things that like build my resume. But like personally, um, I get, I feel the most fulfilled and I feel the most excited when it's something I didn't know or something I haven't done or something that's a new skill set to me. Um, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm growing and I can see that I'm getting better. Like I'm right. accomplishing and I'm doing something. No, that makes sense. What, what were the unexpected things about LA about getting stage time about the challenges that you what was unexpected about that and then how do you compare that to a place like New York? Nobody cares if you're that's not true. <laughs> um, people care less or it feels like people care less um, about how long you've been doing it, how good you are if you have X amount of late night appearances, if you're not like quote unquote hot or like an industry darling or have some heat behind you. It's really hard to get on stage and to get any attention in that city. So is it all based on like how many people you can get to show up to the show? What's your social media following? Um, is it more like that? I honestly feel that's more of the road now, which is really depressing. Um, because they're more reliant on you to sell tickets where it used to be the venue's responsibility. Um, but that that's that's more the road to me, which is just like devastating. But it's more of like, I guess it is that in a way, but it's more of like, look at how cool our show is. You know what I mean? Interesting. Um, and also it just doesn't make sense. Like, why would you book me when you could have a movie star? If there's like, if I've got nothing going on, there's like a million me's, you know? I get you. So, yeah. you, I mean, there are shows that really care about like comedy or curating a certain brand of comedy or a voice of comedy. And so like there's ways and you just keep working and messaging and like hanging in there and you get spots, but it's not like. New York, there's just so many shows. Even if they wanted to have that energy, they couldn't because they got to fill stage time. So it's it's just amazing. To me, like, people talk about LA comics are better, New York comics are better. I don't, I think at the headliner level, it's very similar because people start moving around once they get to that level. I think to me, the biggest difference I see is in new comics. Because in New York, when you're a young new comic, I just feel like it's so much easier and the quality of stage time you have access to is so much better. 
So I just feel, this is my opinion. I feel like I'll be shocked when I like meet somebody from New York and they're like, oh, I've been doing it for three years and their punchlines are so tight. Um, I just find that to be more present in New York. But then like once they start doing it for a certain amount of years, it like levels out if everybody's putting the work in. I just think there's like that initial head start that I've noticed. Right. Because yeah, it's it's just, it's so much harder. (laughs) And and outside looking in, it really seems like um, obviously this is all second and third hand information that I've gotten, but in New York, people start doing stand up because they actually enjoy stand up. Mm-hmm. In LA, people start doing stand up as either there's like two generalized camps where it's like I enjoy stand up or it's I can use stand up to be a, as a conduit to go do other things. It's a mix. Yeah. But even New York, that was there. There just are more actors and writers in LA. So it's a mix, okay. I feel. And I feel like even that is changing, though, because now influencers, like, they want to make money. And how do you make money? You tour, you know? And, like, so much of comedy in every city now is just influencers. So in terms of people who are in it for the love of it, um, probably a reduced market share as opposed to, like, five years ago. Right. Yeah. Everything has kind of just shifted to, again, like, how many followers do you have? Mm -hmm. How much engagement do you have? How many eyes can you put on the venue? When did that start to change? When it was like, the, because you mentioned earlier about the road, how it's like, it used to be the venue's responsibility. It used to be good enough to get in. Now it's, the venues just exist. Are you good enough to bring asses into mm-hmm. seats? When did that start to shift, do you think? I think the pandemic supercharged it because everybody was online. And so it's like social media was always, like you always had your like pop out stars. Um, but it's just the pandemic changed everything. Because that's when TikTok came and why did TikTok get so popular? It's because everybody was inside on their phones. So it just like, it supercharged everything. It was always there, but it used to like come and like be like, okay, Twitter, it's like Twitter stars. And then it would be like Instagram stars and then it would like come and go. And then like now it just feels like it hit so high, it's not coming back down. (laughs) Interesting. I don't know. Maybe it will, but who knows? And now that you're working on your, how long have you been working on the hour for? Um, probably two years. And so now that you're at the point where you want to start shopping it around, how do you do that? Because I feel like that's one of the things that a lot of people, even if you're not a comedian yourself, it's like, how the fuck does somebody get a Netflix special? How does somebody get an HBO half hour? If that's even still a thing anymore, how do you, (laughs) you know, how do you get all that kind of stuff? Like, what's the process that you're going through right now to get like, you're talking about like putting together a sizzle reel Mm. and like shot, like just the idea of shopping something around like that. How do you do that? Well, I mean, I go through like major, major, uh, uh, managers and agents. So, uh, if it's just like a straight stand up special, I'd normally like just tape it on the road and then they could see the material and be like, okay, this is what it would be. Um, I'm my special now, um, I'm doing two versions of it. I could either do a straight hour, but there's also a version where I cut it up with real life interviews. Um, it's kind of like a documentary stand up hybrid. So that is why I'd shoot a sizzle reel for that because I want them to see the tone and the concept and like what that would look like. So it's not just straight stand up. Otherwise I just send them my hour. Right. And so you were speaking about that a little bit earlier before we like got into the podcast. Um, the, I, can you kind of explain the idea behind, or the, I guess, like the the concept behind the yeah. the special, and then what the cut in interviews are going to be? Yeah. So it <laughs> the running theme of my special is I regret chasing my dreams. <laughs> like it's just like the idea of it and how different the reality is than what I thought it was going to be uh, when I was seventeen, and just like how kind of like how much nobody asked me to do this, so I'm not mad. <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> nobody was like go yeah, yeah. It, but it's just like i and a lot of my friends and a lot of performers like we sacrifice so much and to me i thought there was going to be something different at the end of it like i didn't think it was going to be this hard forever and it hasn't gotten easier and it's just like so difficult and stressful and heartbreaking and then there's like points where i'm like is this forever um i'm 17 years in wouldn't it have turned for me by now is this it is this what because i'm a working comic but i'm like i'm not this isn't what i want this is exhausting um and so i'm just kind of at that place where i'm like what the fuck is going on and 
there are so many people who are like they chase a dream like we my thing is like we romanticize following your dreams so much and i think there's another flip side of it that people don't talk about because it's too depressing where it's like man this shit fucking sucks and i just want to talk to like um like an up-and-coming tattoo artist and a wrestler or a person whose dream it was to come to america and it's like did it pan out for you like what was the worst moments of that like how what is your journey what is your life looking like do you regret this so it's just kind of talking about dreams and like also splicing it because this hour at least the top half of it is very autobiographical so just like like talking about my journey with this and then interviewing different people and um whether or not I am just being like a spoiled little bitch because like even just being able to pursue my dream is such a privilege that's an insane privilege so like why why do I feel like I'm just trying to explore all of that and then just learn about other people's lives too right you know so it's a I think it could be like a really beautiful thing because I think that's a question so many people ask because especially with like our college or like our career system I mean you hear those stories about like I was 65 and I opened a restaurant and now I won a James Beard award but it's like okay like one in a million um so much of like what we do in life is determined so young and then you're kind of like sitting there I mean that's what a fucking midlife crisis is you're like (laughs) was this the correct thing I was supposed to do like should I have chased my dream should I have taken my music further as opposed to going to middle manor like how do you know well you know what i mean and it's just like it's just fulfillment and that people asking themselves that question that's what i want to capture because i feel like even though i'm talking about something really specific i just feel like it's very universal it is no no no, it is and you're right it is a privilege to be able to chase your dreams and do what you want um because obviously a lot of people i mean you can always say like around the world this horrible thing and the horrible things are happening around the world but to focus on that only and just be like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm privileged or otherwise, like, I don't know, if, like, not that I don't deserve it type thing, but like, to always generalize like that, I don't think is very healthy. And yeah, it's yeah. good to recognize it, but don't like hyper, you know yeah. what I mean? But on the other hand, I mean, and I, and I say this all the fucking time, I need to look up who actually said it, but like, you're, one of my favorite quotes surrounding this is like, suffering is going to happen either way, because mm-hmm. it's life. Life is full of it, right? There's highs and there's lows, but like suffering is going to happen. So as much of your suffering that you can choose, right? Wouldn't you want to be able to manage that as much as you can? Like, okay, so you brought like going the traditional, all right, I went to college, got my four-year degree, got a nine-to-five job, middle management. There is suffering there too. Is it more quiet suffering? Probably. Because then on that end, you're probably like, man, what? I could have been a cool writer, I think. <laughs> I might have actually been a pretty good comedian, but oh well, here we are. And that's yeah. not saying that that life is bad, but yeah. at least now, like, again, there are so many people, and again, there are so many people going into the entertainment industry, but there are so many more people living the normal nine to five, and there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want, yeah. do it. That's sick. I, you know, I don't want that forever, but I know other people that do really like that and they like that. But and I would say this though, you have so many examples of what that looks like, right? And it's generally cookie cutter. Yeah. But what, like you just articulated, whatever entertainment and stand up and acting, that path can take so many different roads. You won't know how that look, worked out. You will probably know what this would have looked like. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I and I've really liked it's been like hard to do this hour, um, and I've structured it in a way where I'm like trying to make it like jokey, and I have like you know different things in it to keep people from getting like too depressed because it's like they came out to see me, and I'm like I hate my life, uh, and you're a part of it now, uh, so <laughs> I have to like be I've worked really hard to make it a way that is like. They paid for a fucking babysitter. They bought drinks. I want them to have fun. I want them to have a good time. This isn't a goddamn one woman show. So I, I, I'm like worked really hard to try and balance what, <laughs> my internal depression that's like screaming out of every pore of my body and like <laughs> having these people have a good time. But yeah. I've had people come up to me afterwards and genuinely thank me. And they've it's kind of funny. They've been like, no offense, but like you made me feel so much better about my life because. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Oh my God. I'm dead serious. 
<laughs> and they're like, because I chose an office job or I stopped being a musician and I, hearing you talk makes me feel so much better. Well, I mean, that is one of the prices to pay of being the court jester. You know <laughs> no, what I mean? No, but it here's is. the thing. It should be insulting, but it makes me happy because this is what I'm trying to express. You yeah. know what I mean? No, yeah. I mean, I think that's, aside from being funny, that's the number one <laughs> job of a comedian. Yeah. In my opinion, I think the best comics, their secondary job is to say the things out loud that other normal people don't, or other people don't feel like they can say, don't feel mm -hmm. like they're comfortable enough to say, don't feel like they have the people to say it to. Right. Whether that's stuff about politics, whether that's stuff about religion, education, your own personal life and the life that you're leading. Mm -hmm. Part of the job of the comedian is to be able to say, hey, all of these things that you're feeling, I feel some of them too. And it's, here's why it's fucking ridiculous. And they take you on that ride. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you for saying everything I've been feeling, but I just don't know how to say it properly. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, I mean, to have someone go up and say, say that to you, I see why that would be, like, not insulting. Yeah. It's, it's not, like you're doing your job. Because it's like, you're not going to tell me my life is sad. I know my life is sad. I'm tired. <laughs> and it's like, it's really hard I think part of it is social media and I do so much compare and despair, which I'm not supposed to do, but it's like, it is really difficult about how like random this industry has become because it used to be much more structured than there used to be like, there used to be like, people used to say classes of comedians, like that used to be thing, like, oh, he was in that class and now they came up and they have their specials and there used to be like, as random as entertainment was, there was some sort of like vague path and now it's like, oh, they went viral for farting in a cake and now they're selling out stadium like it's it makes no sense and then i'll i'll see my friends like selling shit out and then i'm on a and like writing in like a, another bigger comics private jet and then i'm watching this video while i'm on a public bus to go play a theater when they told me just texted me to say they had 10 tickets sold like it's hard not to want to like yeah. jump in front of that bus yeah no that's a real <laughs> thing no that's it's difficult comparison i mean it's obviously a very general thing but comparison is a thief of joy but mm -hmm. then when you know you're in as deep of it as you are i'd imagine it's very hard not to feel that way yeah because again like yeah, i think that's a lot of what i think that's why like i think stuff like podcasting has taken off so well because people like the authenticity of it but yeah i think anybody who's working at something long enough and they don't feel like they're getting the return on the not like what they deserve but just the yeah. return on the investment it's like i know how hard i'm working i know what i'm doing why is fuck everybody else where's the return on this yeah right so i get that so a part of you probably does want to be like hey what the fuck yeah when's the when's the magic claw gonna come down i think the problem is i worked so hard like i really gave up everything um i've slowed down a little bit not in work ethic i've just allowed more life to happen um but it's like man even now, it's like I work so much and I'm like for such a small return. But then again, it's like nobody's asking me to do that. But I just, yeah. I uh, it's hard for me not to because I want to make really cool shit. Yeah. And to make this cool shit, it takes so much work. But then it's like, like I write a lot of scripts and it's like, okay, I just spent like six months writing and rewriting this thing that I'm in love with um, for it to sit in a pile on some production company's desk. And then it's like, there's a part of you that's like, well, fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I wonder, I, and obviously I'm not asking this to, for you to like speak bad about your management or anything like that, but I wonder like... So the process of getting a manager, how do you select management? How do you select your, I guess, the team you work with or something like that? And what role, because I, I think it's something a lot of people don't really know, including myself. Uh, what role does management play in not only just exposure, but like you getting like different writing gigs, getting like something like a special sold? Like what is their what is their expected role in that? Um, expected role would be um, they send you like, oh, this show is hiring. Here's a submission form. Or like they would shop out your sample script. So like you have a script you wrote that's really solid and then they would send it to different um, companies or networks, try to set generals with you. Um, now, a lot of people in every industry don't do their job um so even or you can get ignored if you're not one of their bigger clients so you can't really rely on that uh so you also have to kind of be doing it yourself the entire time or at least that's been everything i've heard from everyone <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean no matter at what level you also aggressively have to be setting up your own shit 
Um, even if you have a really good manager or agent, there's only so much they can do. Um, and sometimes you think you have a good manager or agent and then you find out you don't. Um, yeah. And they haven't really been doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's like, are you willing to take that chance? It's it's a it's a balance. It's a dance. It's like, uh, who knows? And then sometimes I'm like, man, these people have done nothing. And then they'll send me receipts and I'll be like, oh, they did something and nobody cared. So <laughs> it's it's just it's a complicated mix. You don't know. Right. Yeah, that is. How do I put this? Like, I feel like there's always going to be an air of like the good old boy system with entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it's always like it's not. Like obviously, your work ethic is going to get you to certain places, but it's also like who you know, and it's a lot of like luck and happenstance and all of that. Am I pretty accurate on that? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. It's a lot of who you know, luck, just being what they're looking for at the right time because um, it, aggressively, it aggressively is a casting call, especially for comedy more and more and more. It's like, are you looking, are you what fits what they want? Not, right. are you good? <laughs> you know? I, I think about it because stand-up is now more popular than it's ever been. I think I, I saw... You think it, so? You, well, because, yeah, there was a, a, a statistic. I can't fucking speak. A statistic that I saw that was like a couple months ago where it said, I think the... Uh, it said that uh, the ticket sales for stand-up shows were up like 350% or some shit. That is like absolutely... Yeah. Like stand -up, and, and quite frankly, I mean... Well, fuck, shit, not my tickets. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> You look at something like fucking Kill Tony. Mm -hmm. It's at the end of the day, like obviously it's more of a stand-up show than it is a podcast, but it's a podcast that's accessed for free. And they just sold out Madison Square Garden twice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there is mm -hmm. something there. And cause it's one thing to say, like, oh, like they're at a theater or they're at a club doing like a comedy club or a theater that loves comedy. But not everyone inside Madison Square Garden two nights in a row is a diehard comedy fan. Yeah. A lot of casual enjoyers are getting into it. A lot of people who like either their friends expose them to it or their boyfriend or their girlfriend, their husband, whatever. I feel like, but like, this isn't going to carry on forever. You know what I mean? Like it's the bubble's going to pop. And I just wonder what all of this looks like on the outside of that. You know what I mean? Like I wonder if there's still going to be like, does get once the, Ticket sales are going down a little bit, and who knows where social media is going to take all this shit. Um, thankfully, I think AI, like as far as like comedy goes, I think comedy is the only untouchable entertainment form as far as AI goes. I think it is personally, I, and I just say that because, yeah, there was that like, did you see that George Carlin nonsense where like the no, what's this? so there is a someone built an AI program that uh it did a brand new George Carlin hour. And it wrote mostly like him, sounded really like him, and the estate was like, yo. You that's, can't do that. You can't fucking mm -hmm. do that. So they sued him, got money, whatever. The only reason I say I think comedy un is untouchable by AI is that at the end of the day, comedy is a live in-person experience. I, unless they're going to get fucking iRobot out there and teach that AI how to fucking do comedy. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? Like... Yes, I get that people stream comedy and I get that people watch specials on streamer services, but even then, like, what does AI really do I think that to replace extends that? beyond that, though, because it's like you could also watch fake sporting games and, like, you could watch a robot run faster than a person. Like, it's not... I think there's an aspect of people want to watch what other people are doing, Um and it's like, would you go watch a movie that was completely made by AI? I mean, I'm sure some people would, but a lot of no. people would be like, no. Because I, I mean, because I think a good example is in like the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. Half that shit CGI, mm -hmm. but people, the good, I mean, those the good movies of that series are loved so much because of the characters. Yeah. Not the yeah, the spectacles cool and the big fights and lasers and shit. That's fun, but people love the characters. They love yeah. the humans behind it, like the. Best way I've heard it put is like they, like they love Spider Man because of the man part yeah. of that equation. The spider part's fun; that he's swinging around and fighting people. But it's Peter Parker. Yeah, people latch on to him. So taking that type of logic and attaching it to comedy, again, like I think the most damage AI does to it is peep. It gets so good or as good as it can get, I guess, and people start using that to like write their material. But then how yeah. far, I mean, how far removed is that from Joke Thief anyway? It's not because AI is based right. off of previous works. Right, um, exactly. So it's not, yeah. 
I mean, I like the vision of AI that I've seen certain designers do where it's like, okay, let me just generate something really quickly so I don't have to do all this. And then I go in and refine it and they like tell it an idea and it builds it that way. Yeah. Um, so like it helping artists or helping people move faster is like awesome. I, I mean, it would be super useful for me if I could just feed an AI program a script and be like, hey, write a one sheet about this or write a one page document that summarizes it because that's my least favorite part. Like about an abstract? Script. Yeah, because yeah. you have to, a lot of people won't even read your script. They just want like a one page on it and that takes a lot of work and a lot of mental power for me to boil down, especially because there's all these details I want to include, but having an AI program could easily do that. Now I won't use it because I don't want AI to have access to my written materials. I, uh, but what worries you about that? Just because I mean, I think haven't there been examples where if someone puts in like a very specific prompt, it'll spit out things like almost like that are way too similar to existing properties. So mm, I don't want okay. them to use my ideas or anything I've done and give it to somebody else and have them be like, oh, well, this is mine now. It's like, it's not. That was my shit. Right. Um, so I always worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Because that kind of gets into the, like, not joke thief or like uh, IP thief, uh, thievery, but uh, like the parallel thinking type mm -hmm. thing. It's like, oh, okay. Did you, did you really think about this on your own or did you use this or did you just take this fucking concept and tweak it and just unpackage it differently, which is so fucking annoying. I've been seeing that, I don't mean to go on a tangent, but I haven't seen that a lot lately at live comedy shows the last two weeks or so where people are taking, I'm not going to name any names, but people are taking ideas that, that, that either I've seen on like viral like reels or whatever or very famous comedians bits, and this is nothing new, but they take their premise and unpackage it a little differently to call it their own. And I'm just mm. sitting in the back of the club like... That's not great. That is... Uh, that's Shane Gillis. Right. Or like, I saw that on a podcast. Real. That's... Uh, oh, that's... That's Andrew Schultz. Hmm. It's... It, <laughs> I think there has to be a very strong pattern of that for me to be like, oh, this person is intentionally doing it because there is a lot of parallel thinking. But... Um, I, but I think you can get away with that with parallel thinking if it's only surface level because it's like for instance like we are in i mean and everyone says this about every election cycle but well, we're in the craziest election cycle i think this country's ever been through <laughs> since like fucking abraham lincoln mm -hmm. you know what i mean so like obviously a running joke is okay trump got shot in the ear or joe biden's old or people hate kamala or whatever right mm -hmm. so it's like those aren't new or novel thoughts but the perspective you apply to it is what makes it different yeah like i guarantee I can almost guarantee anyway that if someone gave you and I the same prompt, whether it's about politics or whatever, we are going to unpackage that differently. And that's based on fucking life experience. That's based on experience, obvious a difference in experience and in being a stand up comic. Like, we are going to look at that very differently, right? So you have two different ways of yeah. looking at that. But if you, especially again, especially when it's somebody fucking big that has a special or has comedy that's been seen by millions of people, you know what I mean? And they have a way of looking at something, and then I see another person do it, and it's like, okay, same thought, service level. Let's go one low deeper. What's their, what's weird, what's funny about it, what's whatever about it. Okay, those are similar. They're making the same comparisons. Oh, you're just changing a couple of words. Well, that's different. That's, that's strange. Pretty, yeah. That's, that's not good. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, I don't know. And then sometimes you just have to go, hey, somebody has this joke, and then they should stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to give kudos to fucking Jake Otero. He, uh, me and him were talking a while back, and he used to have a joke about uh, <coughs> it's like eating pussy like a deer or some shit. And he'd been working on it for a long time and worked pretty well. And then the Atel special comes out. <coughs> excuse me. The Atel special comes out, and he, uh, he has, I guess he has a joke very close to that. I haven't seen it yet, but he was like, yeah, he had a joke very close to it. And so I just, He's bigger than me, so I can't use this one yeah. anymore. Oh, well. It's like, well, I respect that more than just like, oh, no, I came up with it first. Like, well, yeah. this is the game of exposure, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I, I see both points of view, so it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But, like, even – um, the fuck was it? Oh, I had a joke that had, like, a really similar comparison, and another comic pointed it out. Like, it was kind of the same – different scenarios, but, like, same – analogy that was the punchline um it was like comparing 
Aladdin's Cave of Wonder to like a sexual organ. Like it was like the same, very similar. And he had a joke like that. And I was like, oh, I think I heard him say that a year ago. And I'm like, I think I came up with this independently because I've been flipping through Disney, but I still dropped it because I was like, eh. Yeah. I kept it for like a couple of weeks. And then I was like, ah, I should just drop it. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh- I knew he had it first, but I was <laughs> like, yeah. And also it doesn't feel great when someone else, when you've written a joke that somebody else can do, you know? So. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I went to when I went to Austin to visit and see stand up there, there's a comic out there. His name's Dylan Sullivan. This fucking guy. He had like I was working on a bit about drunk driving. I just couldn't get it right. I just didn't know. Like I knew what I wanted to do with it, but the skill didn't match like where I wanted to go. And I just saw him do like four and a half, five minutes on drunk driving, and I was like, "You accomplished everything that I wanted to. I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> like, like this subject. Right. No, we're done. And there's no shortage on original thought." There's never going to be, especially in the crazy world that we live in right now. Like there is never going to be a shortage of like original thought or nuance or just like, again, a different way of looking at something. Yeah. That's just part of the, that's just a part of the skill um, aspect of stand up. Before we get done, I was again, I do want to respect your time. What got you into specifically stand up in, in the first place? I was just trying to look cool to a bunch of kids. <laughs> That was it. How old were you? I was 17. Well, I was 16 when I um, started writing jokes uh, and learned about stand-up. And I spent a year doing that because I didn't know you could get on stage before 21. And then at 17, I found out you could. Um, Where did you start? Uh, Chicago. Chicago? Mm -hmm. Where did you first, like, go up at? (laughs) Pressure Cafe. uh, Rest in peace. (laughs) It was a billiard slash open mic. And... (laughs) Um, that shit was pretty wild. I brought my parents cause I was 17 and I didn't know you shouldn't bring your parents to an open mic and they hated every second of it. Every comic was like, why are those two angry Indian people? <laughs> <laughs> my family was furious. They forbade me from doing stand up, which of course, like if you saw the psychopaths that yeah. run through an open mic and all the perverted shit that's coming out of people's mouths talking about dick warts or whatever the fuck they're like (laughs) no like we're obviously not gonna let our 17 year old daughter be around this like it made perfect sense right why they said that (laughs) but i didn't know i didn't know that's what stand-up was gonna be you know that's wild and what has uh obviously we've talked about your your outlook on it now but like what's what i think is a good place to end it what has continued like you in stand-up like what's content what has kept you going uh i don't know i don't even know at this point i just don't even know that i've been doing it for so long it's just like muscle yeah (laughs) you know i mean it's just kind of become what i do which is like i don't even know what i'm doing anymore if that makes sense like i i still think i love it but i just keep doing it because i know if i want to make something really good or like if i want my stand-up to be really good i have to work really hard and i have to keep going up and i have to keep writing um but i if you ask me why i'm doing it at this point i'd be like i don't fucking know <laughs> like, it's no it's become know. this like symbiotic part of your life or, yeah like, this is just the thing that i wake up i brush my teeth make my bed <laughs> and i go do stand-up yeah it's a part of your life And I mean, stand up is also one of the few things where I can create something and immediately share it. Like, it is, you do have so much more power over what you're creating and being able to share it with people and like crowds and stuff. And that is really such a beautiful thing. Cause like writing, acting, like, there's a lot less of that. It's really hard. And it's really such a bummer when like, you pour your soul into like getting really good at theater and then um, you just don't fit the physical description of what they want, no matter how cool you think this performance you've created is or this take on this character is. No one's going to see it except for one casting director who deleted the file. Like it's a bummer, but with stand up, I at least feel like, I don't know. I'm doing anything that matters even a little bit. Like even there's just a little bit of at least my life isn't totally pointless. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's I mean, it's a very brutally honest way of putting it, but you're right. Like with something like and again, I'm not in that world even remotely, but with something like acting and writing, you you put so much time and 
so much personal investment in something just for it to be like, nah, I don't think it's good. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck. Well, could you tell me why? Mm. And I bet they don't. Because no. why, why the fuck would they? <sighs> it's a bit of a fucking meat grinder, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty wild. I uh, I guess I, in that respect, I have a lot of respect for act people who only act. I mean, and it's like, yeah, you put on plays and stuff, and like there is the theater of it all, but it's just not. There's just so much of it that is pouring your soul into a void. It's yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I said this in the beginning, and I mean, you were fucking great. Oh, thank you. You are very good. <laughs> you're, it's the 17 years, it shows. No, seriously. Thanks. Like, in, in the best kind of way, it really does show. Because, like, Look, and this is this isn't throwing shade at anybody, but we have comics here who are very good. But like they like at dry heat, it's like if there's only like this last time is like what, maybe ten, fifteen ish or so? They go out and they see that and it's like they get a little discouraged by it or they whatever. You just went out there and just <laughs> like it was nothing. Like it was really cool to see. Oh, thank you. It was very awesome to see, especially as like a newer comics. I've I've I don't even honestly, I never thought I would start a stand up. Because I've had such like a high respect for it where it's like, that's just you and a microphone. That's crazy. You can figure <laughs> that out. I will watch at home on my couch on Netflix. But then I finally tried it and I fucking I adore it. But like yeah. to be able to see stuff like that happen and to watch Albuquerque slowly turn. It's going to take a few years. But, you know, slowly turn to a comedy city. It's like, oh, yeah, this is dope. Yeah. So we're lucky to have people like you come through. Oh, that's very nice of you. We are. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you for coming by and of doing course. this. Um, I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that if people are watching this podcast, they probably found it because of you. But <laughs> <laughs> the few of my loyal listeners, <laughs> where uh, where can people find you? Like on uh, social media, mm -hmm. website, anything like that? Uh, yeah. You can go to s-comedy.com. Um, my YouTube, Instagram, TikTok are all on that. If you search S-U-B as in boy, H-A-H, um, I'm either at Suba Comedy on TikTok or at Suba A S U B H A H A Suba uh, on Instagram. It's the cringiest, but I did it because it was so incredibly cringy. It was great. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's where you can find me. Sweet. Well, again, thank you very much for coming oh, and you. doing this. If you're ever back in town, I would love to do it again. Hell yeah. uh, special thank you to uh, Sarah for connecting us. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Hey.